I'm a doctoral candidate from the University of Illinois at Chicago. My name is Rand Akashe. Uh, I'm focusing on the link of Alzheimer's disease to diabetes. I'm dedicating this to my grandma who passed away last uh, January and she had dementia. And I also think that diabetes is important because it's on the rise. I like to, stay, to start with the basics, Alzheimer's disease. It's a degenerative disease of the brain's cerebral cortex. Uh, its principal manifestation is dementia and loss of cognitive, cognitive functions. And it's the most common form of dementia. It affects approximately five million Americans in the United States. And it's important to understand that regardless of the etiology, uh, be it Alzheimer's or dementia, both of them are not uh, a normal part of the aging process. So there's something that can be done about that. Patients rarely get symptomatic before 50. Uh, uh, the disease may either be sporadic, meaning that uh, it is uh, late onset, it's senile, it's not related to a direct or a single cause. On the other hand, we have the familial al Alzheimer's disease, and this is the one that's related to uh, uh, clusters within families, uh, single genetic uh, mutations, and this is the less common form, uh, which occurs at early ages in mid, uh, midlife, and uh, tends to be more detrimental maybe. In the world, the prevalence also of Alzheimer's disease is high. We also, we currently have like in 2015, as we see here, we have about uh, 35 million cases and it's projected to increase to 106 uh, million cases by 2050. And that's very high. So starting with the brain, the brain is anatomically uh, and functionally divided into lobes. And Alzheimer's actually starts within uh, this part of the brain, which is the temporal lobe, and it has the hippocampus. And this is the part that's basically responsible of memory and learning. And as the disease progresses, it spreads throughout the brain through other areas, uh, like planning and uh, the ones responsible for planning and judgment, uh, then speech and language, and then the patient would reach a phase where uh, they lack awareness of the outer world, they forget their names, they don't know anything, which is of course sad. And the macroscopic examination, as the professors uh, addressed, involves uh, uh, the atrophy of the cerebral cortex. This is what we see. Uh, these alterations usually become uh, later in life, uh, uh, years after the related risk factors uh, uh, happen or occur, and they may not be the best tools for early diagnosis. And then the molecular characteristics or the microscopic uh, examination of the disease revealed two types of changes that occur in the brain, and these are the plaques and the tangles. First we have the plaques, and these are made of the beta amyloid plaque, pla uh, uh, peptides, which are derived from the uh, amyloid precursor protein, and these exist between cells. They occur like patches here between the neuronal cells, and uh, with time they cause troubles. Uh, we also have the tangles that are made by the tau protein, and these are uh, uh, alterations that occur to the tau protein inside the cells, and eventually can lead to the death of these neurons. So that's how we start. And normally, the amyloid precursor protein on the cell membrane, it gets cleaved by enzymes here like alpha secretase and gamma secretase, uh, generates a soluble uh, fragment that the body can recycle and get rid of. On the other hand, in Alzheimer's disease, we have another enzyme and actually many others, so it's much more complex than this graph. Uh, uh, including the beta secretase and the gamma secretase, which lead to the formation of amyloid beta uh, uh, peptides, which with other uh, conditions like inflammation, they aggregate and they further drive the progression of the disease. And then after the amyloids form, they also cause uh, problems inside the neurons. 
The tau protein is very important to stabilize the structure inside the neuron. It guides the passage of nutrients and uh, neurotransmitter along the brain, uh, the, the neuronal axons. But in Alzheimer's disease, it gets chemically modified or hyperphosphorylated, and this alters its function and causes it to, to uh, form tangles. So the hallmark of many neurodegenerative diseases is actually the formation of protein aggregates. But here, our protein of interest is uh, the amyloid beta. So we are supposed to have a balance between the amount of protein that's being produced and uh, the amount of protein that's being uh, uh, destroyed or recycled by our cell machineries. And it happens in many other diseases, like for example, in Parkinson's disease, we have uh, uh, increased misfolding and aggregation of the protein uh, alpha-synuclein. And there are many other examples. For this reason, pharmaceutical companies have, has, uh, have put lots of effort and money in clinical trials to uh, try to uh, clear these amyloid uh, peptides either through uh, modulating the secretase enzymes that produce them or through direct Im immunotherapy that would target the amyloid beta and help us get rid of it. But as you can see, many of them uh, were discontinued. Some are still going. But maybe uh, it's better if we actually look at the reason that these amyloids are forming. We need to address the cause again, not just uh, these that occur in later stages of the disease. So what causes this imbalance in protein uh, formation and recycling? Uh, and this will help us find answers to how to prevent and treat Alzheimer's disease. This could be genetic, environmental, or uh, an interaction of both. And in, disease, in a disease like Alzheimer's, the familial form, we have three identified genes, which are the amyloid precursor protein, presenilin 1 and presenilin 2, which are considered to be as direct causes of the disease when they exist because they lead to excessive uh, either altered uh, 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 structure of these proteins, therefore their recycling and their functions are altered, or their overexpression. On the other hand, the other genetic uh, 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 genes that are related to Alzheimer's disease uh, are actually considered as risk factors. And we don't like to call them mutations because they, are, they could be just normal variations within the human genome that makes them more susceptible to certain diseases. They are not considered as direct causes to the disease, but rather something that makes uh, this person susceptible to the condition. And here is APOE4, which we've heard about uh, today. The graph actually also tells us that, uh, you know, this, these having any of these genes is not a death sentence. It means that there are lifestyle uh, factors that play into the process. So what are these environmental risk factors? Uh, we have diabetes mellitus, uh, midlife hypertension, midlife obesity, depression, of course, and stress, uh, physical inactivity, a very strong factor, uh, smoking, low education, uh, and uh, also combine that, of course, would increase the number of cases. For example, here we have diabetes mellitus. What the table says is that if we take out diabetes, we can prevent about uh, 826,000 cases of Alzheimer's disease, which is pretty impressive. And this is from Lancet uh, Neurology. They also point out something interesting that late life obesity was actually associated with reduced dementia risk, whereas being underweight was associated with increased risk. I couldn't find uh, <laughs> a good explanation of why, why that is. Maybe later in life, having a, a little bit of extra reserves, maybe it's good. I don't know. But So I'm focusing my, uh, my, uh, the rest of the presentation on the link to diabetes. And this is because uh, diabetes is a disease that's going on the rise. Uh, the rates uh, uh, are going up all over the world. And in America, most 
Americans actually, and according to NHAI's data, consume their energy or the most of their energy from cereals, breads, cakes, cookies, soda. This is by NHAI's data, and this is a recipe for disaster. Um, so what is it about diabetes that actually uh, 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 leads or contributes to Alzheimer's disease is actually hyperinsulinemia. So there are many metabolic risk factors that uh, uh, contribute to Alzheimer's disease and these, as you have heard before, are increased homocysteine, uh, hypercholesterolemia, hyperinsulinemia, increased in inflammatory cytokines because of uh, infections or inflammatory diseases, uh, vitamin D uh, insufficiency, folate deficiency, vitamin B12, uh, deficiency. Other than that, of course, uh, heavy metal toxicity, head injuries, and uh, so on and so forth. There are many uh, of those. So most of the studies that examined uh, a correlation between diabetes and Alzheimer's disease uh, found that diabetes uh, increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease, except for these two uh, cross-sectional studies. And after a closer look into these studies, they found that what, dif what, dif what, what differs in these studies is that the patients were not really hyperinsulinemic. So th that gives us a hint that ins insulinemia or high insulin levels in diabetes may be the strongest mechanisms of how diabetes leads to Alzheimer's disease. How is that possible? Um, scientists found the answer in what we call the insulin degrading enzyme. So this enzyme uh, is expressed actually in many cells all over the body, but it's strongly expressed in our brains, and its function is that it deg degrades or it's re responsible for the recycling of many proteins like amyloid beta and insulin. So what happens is that when in the brain uh, there is uh, uh, the insulin degrading enzyme. If we have too much insulin, then insulin, which has a higher affinity to IDE than amyloid beta, is going to compete and take the IDE away from the amyloid beta. And this way, you have debilitated the, uh, 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 the mechanism that helps your brain get rid of these amyloid uh, proteins. On the other hand, we also have that certain IDE genetic uh, variations uh, leads to their altered functions, and therefore they would lead to higher amyloid beta and high insulin levels uh, in the brain. So it could go both ways. It depends on the uh, cause of uh, IDE uh, alteration. And before I go deeper into the mechanisms related to uh, uh, diabetes and Alzheimer's, I thought of giving just a brief about uh, what happens inside uh, uh, the brain and how uh, it deals with uh, nutrients. First of all, lipids represent 50% of the dry mass of the brain, which is only second after adipose tissue. And the main uh, lipid is cholesterol. The human brain represents only 2% uh, of the total body mass, but contains 25% of the total body cholesterol. In addition to that, um, the cerebrospinal fluid glucose concentration is 50 to 80 milligrams per deciliter, and this compares to 60 to 70% of the concentration in the blood. So maybe the brain needs a bit, uh, it's, uh, glucose and cholest cholesterol are very essential. Maybe it tells us that uh, it likes glucose, but maybe not so much, like not as uh, concentrations com compatible in the blood. And the brain consumes about 20 to 30 percent of the body's total energy needs. And these energy substrates come from the glucose in the fed state, ketone bodies in the fasting state, and gluconeogenesis could happen in fasting state to a lesser extent. And lactate, which is considered an emergency uh, form uh, of... Uh, fuel uh, because by itself it can uh, be uh, translocated to the mitochondria and generate ATP. It also has other uh, important functions in the brain. And of course the medium chain fatty acids, the cholesterol, the lipids, all these have important and independent functions. Um, so inside the brain uh, we have the main cells which are the neurons. These are the ones that are mainly responsible of neurotransmissions 
And we have other supporting cells, uh, which are astrocytes, and we have uh, the oligodontrocytes, and we have the microglia. What happens is that uh, when we need glucose from the blood, it's going to be transported through this carrier, which is glucose 1 transported. It works independently from insulin. And then after that, this glucose uh, uh, goes to either the neurons, to astrocytes, and enters through the GLUTA3 transporter where it can be used to generate pyruvate uh, and then ATP and lactate. Uh, in addition to that, in astrocytes, you see that they are capable of storing some glycogen so they can provide some glucose when the neurons are fasting or lacking in glucose. Uh, the oligodendrocytes use the glucose for uh, uh, lipid uh, or lipogenesis, and this uh, is important for the myelination of axons. We also have the microglia, which also uh, has important uh, uh, metabolic and immune functions inside the brain. Uh, in addition to that, the way that uh, the brain, uh, uh, you know, uh, deals with cholesterol, we have uh, uh, cholesterol that gets formed inside the astrocytes. It could be from glucose. And then it gets packed in these lipid particles, which carry on them the APOE uh, protein. And this uh, is exocytosed. And then because APOE4, APOE, uh, has the ability to bind to receptors on the neurons. This will help neurons uh, uh, uptake the uh, cholesterol and then use it for various metabolic uh, functions related to axonal uh, growth, uh, 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 neurogenesis, and other uh, important uh, maintenance functions. But when actually the APOE4 is here, this binding is... Uh, is not as great, and that's why cholesterol uptake by the cell uh, does not happen as efficiently. So going back to Alzheimer's uh, disease and diabetes, we know that insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and the metabolic syndrome all raise the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, and this is providing more evidence that it is, in fact, a metabolic disorder. Uh, deregulated metabolism occur in the brain, Basically, we have glucose hypometabolism and reduced uptake for different reasons. We have brain deficiency and resistance to insulin and insulin-like growth factor. So glucose and insulin, no doubt, very important, but sometimes the brain cannot deal with them uh, or is incapable capable of dealing with them. Uh, in addition to that, we have a cerebral metabolic rate of glucose that is 20 to 25 percent lower in Alzheimer's disease patients. And this earliest uh, reduction of the uh, hypometabolism in the uh, brain was actually detected in the hippocampus. And this later occurs in other parts of the brain, uh, including the temporal, uh, parietal, and frontal. And just a reminder, Alzheimer's disease in general uh, 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 starts in the hippocampus and the temporal lobes, which are responsible for memory. And this brain glucose hypometabolism is likely a cause and an effect in Alzheimer's disease. So the brain glucose hypometabolism occurs 30 or more years before the onset of Alzheimer's disease or the appearance of any symptoms, especially in individuals with APOE uh, for genotype and also those with maternal uh, family history of the disease. Uh, neural degeneration on the other hand, and reduced cortical mass in the brain by itself leads to reduced overall glucose consumption. So when the brain, gluco uh, brain uh, size with uh, the disease progression goes down, of course, it's going to start consuming less glucose. And it's very important to note that the brain metabolic dysregulation in Alzheimer's disease was found to be specific to the glucose metabolism, while keto metabolism remains unaltered. To speak more about mechanisms, the brain glucose hypometabolism can be related to different causes. For example, reduced glucose uptake due to reduced gluta-1 and gluta-3 uh, expression. That could be because of uh, 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 excessive uh, uh, 
uh, exposure of the neurons to glucose, for example, by itself, it can downregulate down GLUTA3, or it can be genetic, like people who have GLUTA1 deficiency and who cannot survive if they do not follow the ketogenic diet. Uh, we also have reduced glycolysis and acetyl-CoA synthesis from pyruvate that occurs. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction also as important uh, uh, factor in Alzheimer's uh, disease, and it may explain the higher incidence of maternal family history, especially that we get the mitochondria only from our mothers and not from uh, uh, our fathers. So the lower glucose metabolism induces tau hyperphosphorylation eventually, uh, in addition to inducing inflammation, of course, and impairs neurotransmission and causes cognitive decline. And scientists also has named Alzheimer's disease as type 3 diabetes, and that is because brain insulin resistance can occur without obesity, without type 2 diabetes, and without peripheral insulin resistance. And insulin levels were also found to be lower in the brains of post-mortem AD, uh, uh, AD patients. Is type 3 diabetes uh, an independent uh, uh, disease from type 2 and type 1? This is what scientists think because it's uh, uh, confined, to, confined to the brain. Uh, but any type of diabetes can actually increase the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, because hyperglycemia, for example, or increased glucose can uh, 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 form what we call advanced glycation end products, which make proteins uh, uh, dysfunctional and induce inflammation and drive the disease in the brain. Also, even people um, uh, with uh, type 1 diabetes who have their blood glucose controlled, if they are, are taking lots of insulin injections, this by itself is a risk factor to insulin. So the more these people with diabetes have insulin, the more they uh, uh, are at risk of Alzheimer's disease, regardless of which type of Alzheimer's it is or which type of diabetes it is. So we go to the question, can ketones replace glucose in Alzheimer's disease? Ketones can actually provide 60% of the brain's energy demands. So ketones by themselves are a major uh, source of energy to uh, the brain. Uh, however, glucose is still uh, essential, especially to provide lactate for various functions. Uh, according to studies, achieving safe mild uh, ketonemia, and as Dr. Bredson pointed, uh, through a low-carb, high-fat diet or flexible uh, ketogenic uh, diet or through ketone supplementation uh, contributes to about 5 to 10 percent of the brain energy deficits caused by glucose hypometabolism in individuals at risk of Alzheimer's disease. So ketones can uh, uh, be uh, an important uh, energy fuel to compensate for glucose loss, but I want to point that normalizing blood glucose and insulin is still important and should drive the treatment plan because uh, they can actually inhibit the formation of ketone bodies inside our cells. How is that? What happens is that when you are fasting or starving, uh, your cells are going to start breaking down the lipids into fatty acids, and these fatty acids get oxidized, and they form the ketone bodies. They can be all these, acetoacetate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, or acetone, and what we know about insulin is that it is an anabolic hormone. It is lipogenic. It prevents this lipolysis, the breakdown of uh, uh, lipids, and it also prevents the formation of ketones. And if somebody is diabetic and have hyperinsulinemia, like for example in type 2 diabetes, they mis may still have this hyperinsulinemia through the night. So even at night, they're not getting this ketone body synthesis. So my main take home message is that insulin acutely improves in brain function. It is very important uh, for the brain, but long-term and express excessive exposure to insulin reduces its glucose utilization. It inhibits lipolysis and ketone production, which leads to reduced availability of ketone to compensate for reduced 
glucose metabolism. So a high fat, low carb diet, or again, the flexible ketogenic diet may not necessarily induce ketosis if hyperinsulinemia is not normalized. So we can no longer just tell everybody, follow this diet and expect it to work. And that's why we have variations. And ketogenic diet by itself can induce a form of insulin resistance because normally your cells are gonna try to keep the glucose in the blood for those cells that really need them. So it's, a, it's an important survival mechanism. Um, but uh, we want to make sure that things don't go out of control and this is how we do that. We have to check on insulin and glucose consistently when people are on a ketogenic diet. So ketogenic diet and ketone supplements may improve the decline in cognitive function, which, occ which occurs in hypoglycemia, in childhood epilepsy, in brain ischemia, in people with glutamine deficiency. They do not have the main transporter that can send glucose from the blood to the brain. And also people with pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. Uh, all these people uh, seem to be working well on ketogenic diet. And for Alzheimer's disease, short-term improvement was found in patients. But if we're speaking clinical trials and uh, the gold standard of scientific evidence, uh, we want uh, to test it for the long term. Uh, further studies are needed to clarify also whether early screening and targeting of glucose metabolism or hypometabolism may be a useful uh, uh, prevention strategy in Alzheimer's disease. So we need to, to address that. And uh, to speak a little bit about other uh, dietary factors or patterns, energy restriction uh, uh, in epidemiologic studies was associated with lower incidence of many neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. And the benefits comes in decreases in metabolic stress, decreases in reactive oxygen species, also increases in neurotrophic factors like BDNF, inhibition of apoptosis and inflammation, and promotion of uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. So you have more mitochondria, are more capable of burning uh, fuel, and therefore you have more ATP for the brain to survive. On the other hand, overnutrition is very detrimental. It leads to activation of a major inflammatory pathway inside our cells. This is the nuclear factor, kappa B pathway. Uh, and this is what goes to your genome and tells your genes to produce the proteins that cause so much inflammation inside our cells. In addition to that, we have, uh, uh, this would lead to defective autophagy because your cells cannot keep up with too much food, too much nutrients that are running around. And this would lead also to endoplasmic reticular and mitochondrial stress. Altogether, this would need to neuroinflammation, and this will need to impaired intracellular signalings inside the neuron. It would need to reduce uh, uh, n neurogenesis. It impairs the neural stem cells, which are in our brain, and also uh, uh, neural apoptosis occurs. So overnutrition uh, is bad. Uh, it drives, it can contribute to Alzheimer's disease or neurodegenerative disorders and many diseases. And this by itself can drive more metabolic illnesses and other disorders. And um, uh, this is just a table that uh, summarizes the effect of calor caloric restriction and ketogenic diets and ketone body supplementation. Uh, just to emphasize that uh, caloric restriction is not exactly the same as ketogenic diet, and it may be a useful strategy when people cannot follow very high fat diets, cannot tolerate it for any reason. Uh, fasting is really, uh, is really the way to go in this uh, case. And also, um, uh, there are more studies, and we understand uh, uh, what happens in caloric restriction more than uh, in, ketonic, uh, in ketogenic diet, we also know more about its long-term effect. So what are the clinical in implications for diabetes related to Alzheimer's uh, disease? First of all, fasting insulin, glucose, and ketone lo levels should guide the prevention and treatment plan. We live in an exciting time in medicine where we can use these biomarkers to tailor 
uh, our treatments uh, and prevention strategies to every patient according to their needs. And also, we need to follow strategies to improve insulin sensitivity. Uh, because insulin is still, again, it is important, it is essential, it's not by itself a devil, but too much is, too, uh, is not too good. Uh, so we need to improve systemic insulin sensitivity, follow the strategies that we all know, which are exercise, stress reduction, sleep, uh, spices like turmeric, cinnamon, uh, herbs, uh, and eating whole foods. Uh, in addition to that, fast. Uh, I still hear practitioners, including nutritionists, who say, oh, eat five or six meals a day. Well, you don't have to. Give yourself a break. Give your brain a break from all these nutrients. It doesn't need all that stress. You only need uh, so much to be able to carry your functions as long as you're meeting your fibers and micronutrients intake, uh, then uh, you're good. So skipping meals is okay. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, uh, I just want to uh, thank my mentor, uh, Professor Jamila Fantuzzi at UIC, uh, for her constant uh, guidance and knowledge, and also my friend Chris Alicia from Midwestern University Medical School, uh, who revised my uh, abstract, and also the HS organizing committee for uh, accepting my abstract. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. It was uh, very comprehensive. Thank you. Um, do you, what is the, you mentioned that you guys check insulin levels mm -hmm. to assure that people are, m like, I guess, in the better fat burning mm -hmm. or ketone mm -hmm. producing zone. What is the insulin level you look for? Okay, so uh, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm uh, right now I'm a researcher, not a clinician, but the normal fasting insulin levels, yeah, I want to emphasize that it has to be the fasting levels because this is, uh, during the time of fasting is when you want the ketosis to occur. Uh, uh, you measure it in the morning when the patient is still fasting, and somewhere around less than 25 uh, units uh, per liter uh, is good. Do you know how they came to that number? Like, did they measure, was it, were, were there more ketones, or was there, like, lower levels of glucose? Because 25 is pretty high. I actually, if we're talking about... Um, I guess it depends on the unit. But it can go a lot higher. I think they right. do it in um, uh, how it goes in uh, what is normal and what is uh, how people are healthy in general. Uh, like when the, the, the concentrations where most people are healthy and not having uh, problems. So the uh, reference range is probably is what they're looking at. Yes, They yes. didn't come up with their own number. Maybe, yeah. maybe other studies would show lower is better. Uh, but even if you get it down to 10, uh, 8, that, that's also good, yeah. Below 5. Below 5. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the clinicians know. Okay. Good. <laughs> Rand, thank you. That was a fabulous talk, and it's wonderful to see the way all the information is coming together, giving a consistent story. I've got two questions. Um, where do you get the level of 0.4 to 0.5 ketone bodies for bridging the gap from? And the second question is, if somebody is still insulin resistant on high fat, low carb, and f fasting isn't working, you'd add exercise, maybe? Yes. Yep. Yes. So those two questions. Okay. So the uh, the ketone uh, the ketone one point four uh, to point five. I got it from one of the paper that cites uh, uh, clinical trials for that. I can send you the link. I can't recall. Uh, it yeah. Yes, right, I can you. talk to you about thank that. You. And the second is exercise. Um, exercise is uh, uh, known to sensitize our cells to insulin through um, uh, promoting the translocation of glutathione to the uh, uh, to the cell membrane. And uh, uh, it has many other functions. Also, it maintains muscle mass. It maintains, uh, which makes it more capable of metabolizing glucose. Uh, it stimulates uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. So certainly exercise is important. And speaking about Alzheimer's disease, it also improves the blood brain to everywhere, including the brain. Mm -hmm. So it is a great approach. And physical activity 
inactivity is a very strong risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Anne. Mm -hmm. You mentioned ketone supplementation mm -hmm. as one of the options. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular type or method of that that was used in the research or that is known to be more effective? Um, I don't know much about that. I know that uh, they can give uh, acetate or beta-hydroxybutyrate, uh, and it looks like they see some improvement in brain functions. Uh, but um, I, I, I favor, uh, because we're talking about uh, metabolic stress, if you're taking ketones and still you're not giving yourself a break, you're not fasting, you're always eating, there's so much glucose running around, that's still toxic to your neurons. So mm -hmm. it's not the best. It can help when there's nothing else can be done, but the ketogenic diet or high fat, low carb, anything that normalizes insulin and other metabolic risk factors would be better. So it's mm -hmm. not something to rely on the supplementation? Um, not by itself. You, right. you certainly have to address all the risk factors, not just insulin. As Dr. Bredson said, there are many metabolic risk factors. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, it appears that you think the drug companies that are trying to attack the plaque directly mm -hmm. are kind of misguided? No. Um, I, th I just think that prevention is very important. Um, it makes sense that we know that this protein is, maybe by itself it has important functions in the brain, like the amyloid precursor proteins, but um, if it occurs later in the disease, then maybe it's important to catch the disease before all these problems occur. And let's say that somebody is in late stage Alzheimer's disease, if this drug can help them a little bit, uh, then why not? But we're spending millions of dollars on these uh, drugs and immune modulators, which have side effects, and many of them have failed, when we know that the risk factors are related to eating too much, not moving, uh, all these smoking, all these lifestyle factors that can actually uh, uh, be addressed before we think of drugs. And again, uh, the, these drugs would help clear the amyloids, but uh, are we actually helping s stopping their formation? Are we stopping the inflammation? Are we stopping the metabolic stress? No. So you, uh, uh, you can't uh, uh, isolate beta amyloids from everything that happens and pretend like it's the only devil inside the brain. So then you think those drugs are good for advanced patients who I'm not a physician, so I, can, uh, 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 I, I, can, I don't recommend uh, drugs. Uh, I am a nutritionist, so I think it's a physician's job to decide when to prescribe drugs. But I think uh, it is something to keep for late stage of disease, and even in late stages, we can still modify the lifestyle, and you get much better results. This is something I'm sure of. As, as far as the drugs, I mean... Uh, okay. Thanks. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Thank you.